Hi everyone, welcome to this new session of CFA Level 2. Today we will be covering the next reading of fixed income, the fourth reading, which is credit analysis models. Now, I have one good news to share that uh, a lot of students are in fact afraid of fixed income when they start it out. But uh, the good thing is whatever technical you had at fixed income is pretty much done within the first three readings. So we still have two readings left of credit analysis uh, models and credit default swaps. But the good thing is these readings, they do have new concepts. So they are not just a repetition of what you did at level one. There would be new things, but they are fairly basic new elements that you will be introduced to. There won't be any sort of big technical calculation or anything as such that you'll have to deal with. So whatever is the technical part of fixed income, the good news is all of that is already behind us. We just have two readings to cover so that we can wrap up fixed income. Let's start with the first portion of today's reading, which is going to be some basic terms that you have to be familiar with when we talk about credit analysis. Now, credit analysis by itself is simply an analysis of any entity from the point of view of judging whether that entity has good credit worthiness or not. Basically, we are talking about a situation where if they take a loan, will they actually be able to repay it or not? So when we are trying to do that kind of analysis, there are some terminologies that we have to be familiar with. So let's start with the first one itself, which is expected exposure. Now, expected exposure is simply the total amount which could be exposed to a credit risk. So effectively, let's say a bank gave a loan for $100 million. If the other party which received the loan, if they end up doing a credit default, if they end up defaulting on their payments, the bank will have all of their $100 million at risk of being lost. So there is a potential for the bank to lose all 100 million. So whatever the total amount is which gets exposed to the risk, that is known as expected exposure. Now in reality, if I just continue with this example of a bank giving a loan of 100 million, normally no one gives a loan without a collateral for such a large amount. So there is going to be some asset that would be used as a collateral as a security and then there would be some portion which might be additional. So let's say in a hypothetical situation, normally in the real world, the banks take high collateral than the loan. But let's say that the bank gave this loan of 100 million and against it, it had a collateral asset, a security asset worth, let's say 60 million. So effectively, in case the company defaults, the bank will seize control of that asset worth 60 million and the bank will then have the right to sell that asset to the, in the market and recover their 60 million. Now, if you think logically, the bank gave a loan of 100 million. So the total amount which all of a sudden got exposed to the risk was 100 million. But did they actually lose 100 million? No. They were able to recover 60 million by the asset and 40 million was lost. That 60 and 40 is your point B and C. Recovery rate is how much money you might be able to recover out of the total amount that has become exposed to the credit risk. And loss given default is sort of the remaining portion. Loss given default is how much money would you actually lose in case of a credit event. So this is not just talking about money exposed to risk. This is talking about money that you might actually lose. So recovery rate is 1 minus loss severity. Both of these are percentages. So effectively, uh, if I just convert that 60 million, 40 million into percentages, 60% is the recovery rate. 40% is called loss severity. So the percentage of amount that you might stand to lose in case of a credit event, that is known as loss severity. And loss given default is just the loss severity, but denoted in a dollar value. So loss given default is loss severity multiplied with expected exposure. So basically dollar amount of how much money you could lose in case there is a default. So I hope the first three set of terms are clear. Expected exposure is the total amount exposed to risk. Recovery is how much you might be able to recover from that. And loss is how much you might stand to lose from your expected exposure in case of a credit event. Now credit analysis as a topic, as a concept, is focused on study of two things. One of those is how much loss you might have in case a default happens. So that is, of course, a relevant part. So these first three elements, they form the first sort of parameter of judging the credit analysis or judging the credit worthiness of any particular company or any transaction for that matter. 
the second element is my probability so i know that in case a company has a default this is the amount that i might lose but i also want to understand what is the chances that the company might actually default because normally when a bank gives loan 99% of the times the other party that receives the loan they make the due payments and they repay the loan as per the required schedule so you are not having default in case of every single loan that you are giving so you also have to judge not just the loss that you might have in case of a default but also what are the chances of that default happening in the first place because if default doesn't happen then this loss will also not happen so first element is of course judging the loss in case a default happens second element is focused on what are the chances of the other party of the counterparty committing a credit default during a year or at a longer stretch of time period so you have probability of default in a year and probability of survival again both are sort of opposite of each other probability of default in a year is simply what are the chances that any particular company might commit a credit event or have a credit default during the given financial year and probability of survival is simply what are the chances that the company would not commit any credit event and would survive the entire year without any sort of credit default now from a meaning perspective both of these are fairly simple now these equations when you look at them they might look slightly complicated but in reality they are just using some basic concepts of probability that you've already done at level 1 let's let's run through some of those equations so probability of default in a year well firstly probability of default in first year so you can have different probabilities in different years the first year one is known as hazard rate the probability of default is given a mathematical equation of hazard rate multiplied with probability of survival t minus 1 now for now you can ignore these equations if they seem complicated we'll do a small example to understand them in a more logical way probability of survival is simply 1 minus hazard rate to the power t for however many years you have now by looking at just these equations it might be slightly technical so let's take up a situation where hazard rate is 5% which means there is a 5% chance that the company would commit a credit default within the first year now in this particular situation let's talk about all the years so let's say year 1 we need probability of survival and probability of default now as we have already established probability of default of first year is itself the hazard rate it's just a different name that we use for that so effectively we can say if the hazard rate is 5% there is a 5% chance the company will commit a default within the first year now think logically if there is 5% chance the company will commit a default there is 95% chance that the company will not commit the default which means company will survive the year without any credit event so probability of survival just becomes the balancing figure now under normal set of calculations for second year we we'll again put 5% and this would be 90% this would be true if this was just a generic calculation but this is where these equations become relevant now again if you understand this example in a logical sense you don't have to cram these equations now this value of 90 and 5% this is wrong because over here we will introduce a concept of probability that you probably covered at level 1 known as conditional probability that some events can only happen when some previous event has already happened think logically if i want a probability that the company will default in the second year for a company to commit a credit default in the second year it must have survived the first year that is a precondition so i cannot just keep 5% as it is rather it becomes a conditional probability that for default in second year the company must have survived in the first year if i want default in fifth year the company must have survived for four years because if company already committed a default in the first year 
it's already going to go under liquidation bankruptcy and there would be no other option. We won't have a case for second year. So for that reason, probability of default for second year. This is hazard rate multiplied with probability of survival t minus 1. So if this 2 represents t time, this would be probability of survival for year 1. So if you think logically, for a default to happen in second year, the company must have survived first year and then what is the chance of it committing a default in any year. So this would be 5% multiplied with 95%. This will give you 4.75%. And now the balancing figure would be 90.25%. So out of 95% that the chance the company will survive after first year, in the second year, there is 4.75% chance that it would commit a default. So there is a 90.25% chance that it would probably survive second year as well. So I hope all of that makes sense. Lastly, aside from these probability things, we have trade valuation adjustment. This is simply price of risk-free bond minus price of risky bond. Now, if you think logically, a risk-free bond, because it doesn't have risk, the yield would be low. And if the yield is low, the price in the market would be higher. Comparatively, a risky bond will have higher yield and if the yield is higher, the prices are normally low. Yield and prices have an inverse relation. So for that reason, whatever the difference in the price of a bond is, purely due to bond having great event or credit risk. So these two bonds that we compare, they are often going to be identical. The only difference is for one, we'll use uh, a risk-free situation and for the other, we'll introduce a great risk into all the mix. So as a result, whatever the difference in price of the two are, just due to introducing credit risk, that is known as credit valuation adjustment. So I hope all of these terminologies and basic calculations are clear. Let's move to an example to understand all of them in a better way. 